Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all very much for being here. Um, you're here at what we all know is a very critical time, and um, I know there have been a lot of references today to the questions that um, we have and the public has about um, how much Pakistanis and the government knew about where Osama bin Laden was and how he could have been living for so long um, within such close proximity to so much of their military establishment. So I'm, I believe that we should continue to ask those questions in the coming months and hopefully we will have some answers and they will be answers that will help address the public concerns here. Um, I appreciate what you are all saying about the need to continue our relationship with Pakistan and how important that is. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think a knee-jerk reaction to what um, Pakistan knew or didn't know is an appropriate response, but I do think it is important for us to get some of those questions answered. Um, I'm going to try and ask the question that I think um, Senator Corker was alluding to in a little different way. And that is, do you think that bin Laden's death affects the strategic calculation of Pakistan's military with respect to where the real threats or where there are internal threats to the country? And do you think um, they will reevaluate that or that this will have any impact on how they view those internal threats? Let me, I think it will have or it can have an impact on the security establishment's view of the remnants of Al Qaeda within the country. I have testified that I don't think it will have a big impact on their view about their proxies along the Afghan border. And what... what can I just get you to explain a little more clearly what you mean by that? Yes. Uh, uh, Al-Qaeda is now utterly peripheral mm -hmm. to Pakistan's interests. They accepted fleeing Al-Qaeda leadership uh, in 2000 and um, one. Uh, and it might have served some purpose at the time. It no longer serves any purpose, so I think they can give these folks up. But the Afghan Taliban, the folks who will, they believe, serve their interests in an Afghanistan after we leave, are a different category. There are links, but I think they will continue to be viewed as an essential part of Pakistan's national security. Now there's this third group of people. It's a very complicated people. A lot of folks have guns and shoot at one another. But Samina has mentioned this Punjabi-based set of groups. And the most important one is the one we call Lashkari Taiba. These are the guys that are trained, equipped, and based in Pakistan. And every once in a while, they blow something up that's really important in India and create a big crisis. And we're the crisis manager. And these are the guys, in my judgment, who pose the biggest of all threats, bigger than Al-Qaeda, what's left of Al-Qaeda, and even bigger than these outfits we don't like along the Afghan border, because these guys, the Punjabi-based extremist groups, can spark a big, ugly, uncontrolled conflict between India and Pakistan. Uh, and can, can I just ask uh, Mr. Yusuf and Dr. Ahmed, do you both agree with that assessment? I would say that 
I not only agree with this assessment, but I think one needs to also remember that even as we are talking about the insurgency across the border, the network, the nexus that we are talking about are the Punjab-based jihadi groups plus Al-Qaeda, or the remnants of Al-Qaeda, what's left of it. And let's not forget there's many types of groups within Al-Qaeda, and we see a lot of them passing through Pakistani territory and the Haqqani network. We're not just talking about one entity which is based on the tribal borderlands, and I think this is where the danger lies. We see too much of an emphasis in forming U.S. national security policies to look at FATA as the problem. When you really need to be looking at the terror threats that have been posed to the security of the homeland, they don't come from the Pakistani Taliban or the Afghan Taliban. They're coming from groups such as the lashkar e -Tayaba. Taking these groups with far greater seriousness is not just a matter of a threat in the region or even a possible attack that could lead to a confrontation between two nuclear armed neighbors. I'm talking about the potential, the real risk. And this, by the way, has been raised again and again now at levels of the U.S. government, including, including in the national intelligence estimates of the threat that this particular group and others linked to it pose to the U.S. heartland. And to answer your question, let me also say this. It's absolutely essential to acknowledge that there is not one government in Pakistan. It is a democratic transition. As far as the arms of a democratic government are concerned, we are forgetting in all this discussion the legislature, the Pakistani parliament. There is talk now amongst parliament, pa Pakistani parliamentarians about an inquiry. How did this happen? Who was responsible? Why did it happen? What are the implications for our national security? Um, and there are deep concerns being voiced. And I think this is an opportunity again for the US Congress to also reach out to those committees in the Pakistani parliament that have expressed deep concern about this incident and about the threats and the real threats that it poses to US and Pakistani national security interests. Um, thank you, Senator. Uh, let me first uh, agree on the bin Laden issue. Uh, Al-Qaeda had become peripheral to Pakistan's uh, Afghanistan calculus long time back. And if bin Laden would have died, say, in 2001, the Afghan calculus wouldn't have changed much. In fact, I think it's a, it's a bit of a worry for the Pakistanis to see that so many Al-Qaeda remnants are, are still around. As far as the question of extremists goes, I'm convinced that this idea of good versus bad extremists is a very dangerous one. Ultimately, every type of extremist and terrorist in mm -hmm. Pakistan has to be dealt with. Um, the real question to my mind is how do you do it? And there are two issues here. The first issue is a capacity issue. And I don't think we have a clear answer on this. There's a, there's a debate on whether the Pakistani security establishment, civilian and military, have the capacity to open up any more military fronts at this moment. So that's, that's one, because it's very easy for things to backfire. Second, I think there's an issue of the reasons why these groups continue to exist. And I think one has to be blunt about this. Pakistan used these proxies for a long, long time. And if I were to look from the US Congress perspective, I would say capacity is one issue. Pushing them to change the strategic mindset, of course, is the other one. And the third is to see where these problems actually lie, and perhaps be a bit more proactive to go out and look at it in a regional perspective to try and hit uh, the very basis of why this is happening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator.